No, I enjoy doing the, the responses. Um, it takes time though. So, um, yeah, of course, you know, because I, I hate to just give a one sentence answer. Short shrift. With, yeah, without, give a short shrift without actually giving some evidence, um, giving a better picture, best picture I can give. And without further ado, if, yeah, actually the first three slides are um, this week's not responses to the questions, but rather right. this week economic data and the, you, the first new piece of data this week was uh, re released on Tuesday and I commented on this in the webinar but it's small business optimism index and um, I always think this is a significant indicator uh, and again the reason I always say that is because small businesses employ 50 percent of all Americans and account for between 60 and 80 percent of all new hires and so what small business people think really makes a difference to the economy. If they're optimistic, they're more inclined to hire people and invest in their companies. And so the, the uh, result here for November was an exceptional reading, to use their phrase. And you can see that it rose 2.3 points. So basically uh, tracing out a trend that's you know, more or less stable near the record all-time highs of back in 2004. And uh, I don't know if that's record. This thing goes back to 1973, I think, but at least with respect to the time period, 86 to the present, we're pretty close to records previously reached in 2004, five, and then again last summer. So this is really good news. And the headline, small business optimism sees major spike in November. I don't know if that's a major spike. This guy gets a little hyperbolic, I think sometimes, a little enthusiastic, but <laughs> anyway, he's really optimistic. Uh, if you read the text of his report. The second piece of new data this week was retail sales reported this morning. Okay, so retail sales reported this morning. Um, all you have to do is just look at these trends and. There's no new story here. It's just continued strength in retail sales. Real retail sales adjusted for inflation. Retail sales adjusted for inflation. In this chart, once again, and you did a story on this, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, same story there. Very strong uh, real retail sales gains, which means that Americans are getting more bang for their buck. And uh, really impressive numbers there. All right, moving on to... Um, responding to these questions. These remaining two questions here um, are the only two for which I have not included a chart. So <clears throat> these are just standalone. I wonder if Fritz has any comment on longevity annuities. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, I don't. I, I've never even heard that term. I don't know what a longevity annuity is other than just a plain old annuity that ensures against longevity risk. So. He says, as a CPA, it's the only annuity that's made me perk up my ears. So I don't know what he's referring to, and so I don't have any comments on that. Um, I saw a report on the national growth number that was above the 35. I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, uh, and maybe it was 3.5, maybe it's supposed to be 3.5, I don't know. But when they pulled out California, the number drops to about 2%, is this correct? Once again, I don't have an answer on this. I've never seen a calculation of US GDP if you pull out California. That's an interesting question. And maybe he's saying national number was 3.5 and when you pull out California, it's 2%. Yeah, or maybe John will clarify it for us. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, question number 4A and number six related questions. Is household net worth being driven most significantly by home value appreciation? And the answer to that is no. If you look at the chart of household assets on the left side, uh, you can see that financial assets are 72% of total household assets. And you can see the appreciation in absolute terms in financial assets is a lot greater than the appreciation in non-financial assets, which is principally um, home, uh, the value of homes. So also net worth is not being driven most significantly by home value appreciation. 
And the second question is, can he shed any light on the amount of outstanding student loan debt? Is this the next debt crisis, as the media would suggest? And the answer to that is no, it's not. First of all, um, when I um, computed household liabilities, and you may have noticed this month, but I thought it was, um, I actually got some really good feedback on having done it this way for the first time, comparing household liabilities to household assets, <laughs> you really get a really different picture. You take away a really different conclusion from uh, what a lot of the common perception, I think that, you know, household liabilities and mortgage debt are about to swallow us alive and stuff like that. It's absolutely not true, but student loan debt is included in consumer debt in this picture. So as a percent of the total, you can, you can put it into perspective. So now let's look at this a little more carefully. And what we're gonna do is uh, take this right-hand chart and onto this next page, expand it. So these are high household liabilities. And now we're gonna break those down using a different data series, but actually the numbers come out exactly the same, of course, because they are what they are. But the data series on the right-hand chart comes from the New York Federal Reserve, their household debt and credit um, report that they re release every quarter. So here you can see the breakdown of student loans in the red. And student loans have, um, haven't been growing. You can see the thickness of the student loan haven't been growing at an extraordinary clip, although you can see continued growth. And they're probably the biggest single item in, uh, in non-mortgage liabilities, but nonetheless, you can actually get a handle on how big the student, the, the stock of student loan debts is here. And then in the lower uh, panel, you can see how um, delinquencies have stabilized. So going all the way back to um, 2012, you can see how delinquencies surged, but now have stabilized for a, a bunch of different reasons. So. The answer to the question, is this the next subprime mortgage crisis brewing? And the answer is no, it's very definitely not. The mere fact that we're all focused on it and know about it, and most importantly, Congress has been trying to address this in one way, one way or another, is very significant because the problem with the subprime mortgage crisis is nobody even knew these things existed to the, <laughs> to the extent that they did. The Federal Reserve didn't even get it until they blew up. And so I think I take that as a real positive. Everybody's focused on this problem, and, and again, delinquencies have stabilized. So, and what and what, what what stabilized them? By the way, what factors? I uh, I that's a I don't I can't answer that. I don't know. Uh, you know, it might be different underwriting standards. It may have changed underwriting standards. I I don't know. Uh, they're all insured by the federal government, so this is these constitute liabilities for the federal government. Uh, but again, in the context of the total federal debt outstanding, it's a pretty small piece. What is it? It's one, maybe one trillion out of uh, you know, 15 trillion or something like that outstanding. But that's a good question, Andy. I don't know what stabilized because you can see it was a steadily, steadily growing um, delinquencies until something happened. And I would have to research that further. Next question, uh, two questions. How do we get the political will to increase taxes? And, um, you know, this is just guesswork. How do we? I don't know. My answer, my, my hunch has always been, well, uh, one day we wake up and Standard & Poor's or Moody's once again downgrades U.S. sovereign debt from double A to single A, something like that. The stock market drops 2,000 points or, you know, some dramatic reevaluation, you know, of the debt problem might precipitate Congress actually doing something. Um, but other than that, I, I don't know how we get the political will to increase taxes. That's the perennial problem of, you know, our politicians wanting to keep promising more and more stuff without paying for it and just borrowing to finance. So I don't have an answer for that one. And 4B on the taxes slide, why in social security, and he's referring to the red down here, 
why is that included as a tax? Isn't it really supposed to be a forced savings program? Um, well, answer to that question is it, semantics. Uh, you can call it what you want, but these are the total sources of revenues for the federal government from which they have to pay all of the obligations, which include Social Security and Medicare. So um, you can call it a forced savings program or you can call it a tax. It's the same either way. If you take that out, aren't we more in line with, with the exception of value-added tax, Germany and France? And uh, yeah, if you take away the red and if you take away the value-added tax, you can say, yeah, we're more in line, which is to say the taxes on income and profits in all three systems um, are uh, uh, about comparable as a percent of GDP, but that really doesn't mean much because <laughs> you 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 can't you can't take away you can't take them away. You have to have these huge contributions from Social Security and other payroll contributions in the case of Germany and France, and you also have to have these huge contributions from the VAT in order to pay for their um, much more liberal social programs. So I'm not sure why he's making that point because uh, you can't take them away and then say we're comparable. Um, number seven, sometimes you can rebalance your portfolio and add to your return due to reversion to the mean. If we take out EFA and or emerging markets, is it possible we miss out on a reversion to the mean on EFA and emerging markets? Um, what I've done here is to compare the PE ratios of in the yellow, the United States, and in the green, emerging markets, and in the blue, EFA. So we're making a comparison of the relative valuations of the three markets. And when they're talking about reversion to the mean, it's hard to say what the mean PE ratio is, but what you can say is, well, today, the United States looks to be more expensive than EFA and emerging markets. However, the history here suggests that the United States is always the most expensive market because it's a higher quality market. We have better growth and more consistent growth. The second question is, okay, but historically, if you look at Europe in blue versus US in yellow, Europe, EFA, sorry, EFA, not Europe, EFA and US trended much more in line and today they have separated. Good point. So is it going to be the case that EFA pulls back up in line with US, in which case, yes, it would behoove you to own EFA because the gap would close. Um, perhaps the valuation gap it doesn't mean actually that their market would outperform the US. But my answer to that is no, not necessarily, because qualitatively there are huge differences. And this is what I've been talking about. The growth prospects in EFA uh, aren't even close to the growth prospects here in the United States. Europe is Europe is moribund. If they can get 1% GDP growth, they'll be doing well, and we will continue to knock out 2% 2, 2 something like that. And then far east is Japan. Well, again, we've talked about Japan, but is Japan going to start knocking out 2% GDP growth? No way, no how and GDP growth translates to earnings gains. So no, I don't think necessarily that you're gonna see a reversion to the mean. And by the way, this has been the story from the major brokerage firms year after year after year. They keep saying, well, there's this valuation gap and it's gonna close and it just keeps not happening. And it keeps not happening for a good reason. Qualitatively, there will continue to be very significant differences. And, and the same is the is the main driving force there the demographic trend? The uh, is that is that is the, or is that the V? That, no, it's that, two. That, it's it's two things, Andy. It's the demographics is huge, yes. But secondly, it's it's qualitative. They they just going back to these relative tax, these relative tax burdens. How are you going to grow an economy if forty six percent of the total national output is being taken by the government to redistribute. You see, it takes reinvested capital to grow an economy. 
and Germany and France are way behind the eight ball at a significant disadvantage to the United States just in their tax structures. So it's two things. It's and and so what I'm addressing there is is productivity gains. The only way you get productivity gains is being able to reinvest in your businesses, and because you you buy new plant equipment, more efficient stuff. And the only way you do that is you have cash left over from operating earnings. Well, if there's lots less cash left over because you've paid it to your federal government, then you're not going to be able to achieve the kind of productivity gains that we've gotten here in the United States. So it's 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 um, it's twofold. It's a double barrel problem for them: demographics and their tax burdens and relative productivity. And that's not going to change anytime soon. Yeah, it's tax it's not, policy. Sorry, it's tax policy. Really interesting how that emerging markets separation yeah yeah uh, how how early on the, the the emerging markets really did keep up it seems the gap was well again remember remember the time period we're talking about emerging markets converged with yeah in the united states what beginning in 2007 and what did we talk about it was the China phenomenon in 2007. So emerging markets soared and peaked in 2007. It was the China story. And that China story is one and done. And now emerging markets, the separation in valuation then revert, has reverted to, actually this gap was a lot wider historically all through the decade of the, of the 90s and 2000s. And so you could make the case that, yeah, reversion to the mean would actually mean wider separation, not narrower separation. Anyway, the, the, um, the, the, so that's a discussion of uh, number seven. Now let's read uh, question eight. Can you speak to the general consensus from JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, that international markets will outperform over the next 10 years? I believe this is based on lower valuations in international markets, but I'm not sure why the consensus is that their valuations will revert to their mean. Couldn't it be argued that the valuations are low for a reason? Just curious why I've been so bullish on international stocks. Precisely my point exactly. And again, what's so interesting to me is that this has been the story at the beginning of every single year that I can remember in recent years. The major firms in Wall Street keep saying this is the year to go abroad and it keeps not happening. It's so interesting. Now let's go to the next slide and continue along the same topic. Doesn't the volatility in emerging markets give them value in a diversified portfolio because of the opportunities that come from rebalancing? Now what he's addressing here is, well, what kind of correlation is there between emerging markets and the standard and poor? So, in other words, if you have zero or, no, or negative correlation, then maybe an asset class gives you value in that it dampens overall portfolio volatility. Are you with me? Are you following? If you have zero or negative correlation, then your overall portfolio return uh, uh, or overall portfolio volatility would be dampened, except that's not the case. The correlation coefficient between the Standard and Poor's 500 and emerging markets is actually 0.75. That's a pretty pretty high number. <laughs> and the reason that it's not higher is because of the underperformance of emerging markets. You follow that? And and so uh, so again, uh, my response yeah, it's, is it's all been it's all been yeah. It's all been negative, <laughs> the, the volatility. Yeah, so my, my, my response to this question is no. As a matter of fact, these two markets are highly correlated. And the problem is emerging markets just keeps lagging the standard of poor's 500. So there are two concepts here. Number one is overall return. Number two is overall volatility and the correlation of volatilities. Well, number one, return from emerging markets has substantially trailed S&P 500. So to include it in a portfolio, does its lack of correlation to the S&P make up for its lagging returns? And the answer is no, 
because it doesn't have negative correlation. It has significant positive correlation. It just doesn't do as well. So no, it's not a reason to own um, emerging markets wow. because you might have, you know, these guys are calling it reversion to the mean. Um, I would call it, you know, negative correlation. You don't have negative correlation. You have very positive correlation. Are you going to talk more about the EFA thing? Because I wondered if you have anything to say about Brexit. Um, no, I and I don't know that Brexit really impacts that discussion at all. Uh, Britain is such a small piece of the international index and EFA specifically that I'm not sure it matters. Um, what I will say though is once again, EFA is substantially lagging the S&P again this year. Uh, essentially confirming what we've been talking about. And so the numbers are just going to look worse when I recalculate at the end of the year. So I'll cover that in January. But I'd imagine it likewise, um, like emerging markets, has a positive correlation. You know, IFA is 92% IFA is correlated with the S&P 500. <laughs> so it's really, yeah. But also, but it's, so it's the same issue is it's the same issue yeah it's the same issue um okay so now let's go to question number eight from david the strong opinions on a weaker dollar and stronger euro are you still as positive about u.s equities being stronger than emerging markets or europe i think he actually got this backwards because uh, any time I've ever commented on the U.S. dollar, my point has been, no, I think the U.S. dollar will remain strong against the euro, not weaker dollar and stronger euro, but the other way around, stronger dollar and weaker euro. Are you still positive about U.S. equity being stronger than emer And the answer is yes, I think so. And, and, and again, um, you know, I don't want our audience to think I'm making a tactical call. I don't think they believe that, but these guys are all focused on, in these questions, these guys are all focused on, well, what's going to happen this year? Because what they're hearing, they're all hearing these tactical calls from Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, and so forth. This is the year to invest abroad. And my approach has been, look, I don't know if any given year, that'll work or won't work. What I do know is if you look over the last 25 years, it's definitely been a losing strategy and I don't see any reason for that to change. And among the reasons for which I say that is the US dollar is gonna sustain its value against the Euro. It's gonna maintain strength against the Euro. And in this chart is the US dollar. You can see that actually year over year, the US dollar is almost unchanged, 0.8% up year over year. And there's no reason to think that the dollar is going to get weak against the euro or the yen anytime soon, which could be an argument to then invest in EFA or, um, or, or Japan. But no, so it's steady as she goes. U.S. dollar remains, maintains its strength. And those markets, I think, will continue to lag the United States, although in any given year, who knows what can happen. Um, this is a really good question, and this is a, an issue that I've addressed um, repeatedly, although at intervals. Question number five, curious about Fritz's opinion on our articles appearing in the Wall Street Journal elsewhere about the impact of corporate stock buybacks during 2019. The article seemed to imply that some of the market's performance is tied to this. Great question. It's also become a political question, although I haven't heard politicians talking about this recently. They were seemed to be on this bandwagon last year, but it's died out. The answer is from Ed Yardeni, who is the, the go-to analysis in this regard, as far as I can tell. Nobody else has done the study and come to the conclusions that Yardeni has in this regard, and he nailed it. Stock, and, and interesting to me, and this is just an aside, Andy, but I see lots of guys from, you know, from all, all kinds of reputable people in the media still talking about how corporate stock buybacks are increasing 
earnings per share and goosing the market. And it's not true. They should and know you, right now, but you, they don't. You, didn't you cover this previously a while back? I covered it. I, I covered it two times, you know, at six month intervals. But it's probably a good to go back to this once again, because we're almost at the end of 2019 sure. and people continue to say this. They keep saying this in the media and it's incorrect. So Yardeni first published this very detailed analysis in May of this year, stock buybacks, the true story. So just the excerpt here is, gives you the punchline. The widely believed notion that buybacks boost earnings per share by reducing the share count isn't supported by the data. For the most part, uh, companies repurchase their shares to offset the dilution in the number of shares outstanding resulting from employee compensation. That's why they've been doing it for the most part. So interesting. And the proof is in this single statistics, so these single, this single chart. If corporate buybacks were resulting in reducing the number of shares outstanding, hence goosing earnings per share, artificially, some people would say, then these two figures wouldn't be equal. In other words, the aggregate S&P 500 earnings and the per share S&P 500 earnings per share would be lots higher than aggregate, right? If you're reducing the share count by buying back shares. Whereas the actual result is no, that hasn't been happening at all. So I hope you follow that analysis, but it's absolutely, it's gotta be correct. Um, and it's not the case that companies have been artificially inflating their share prices by buying back shares. Simply not. Does that have corporate governance consequences as well as you know the the the, the technical aspect on driving stock prices? Well, I, it would you know it might be a corporate governance issue if it were true that companies are so-called artificially boosting their share price by inappropriately using corporate cash to do that and not reinvesting in their businesses, but that's not true. None of it is true because it gets into a further accounting issue, which is probably too complex for most of these guys to really want to know about. But you see companies aren't buying back sh their shares with, with retained earnings after tax earnings. They're actually buying back shares with expense uh, with, with, uh, through the expense item on their income statement. I don't know if you follow this, but it, it's, it's very, two very different concepts. And yeah, but, uh, but, what I'm, but, but, but they're doing it to offset the dilution in the number of shares outstanding from compensating employees with stock. Right. That's why I'm asking about the corporate governance issue. And I, would say that's, I would say that's good governance because they, on the one hand, they're forced to compensate employees with shares because in, in order to remain competitive, lots of companies have to give incentive uh, in, incentive with uh, stock ownership. And, and I would say it's good governance in for them to be offsetting the dilution that results rather than just diluting themselves and diluting their earnings per share. Um, so I, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with what they're doing. It, it makes what they're doing makes perfect sense. They're offsetting the dilution that results from perfectly rational stock compensate stock based compensation. You would have to make the case that stock based compensation is somehow inappropriate, and that's that that case can't be made. Well, it's just going to put more control of the company in the hands of employees and former employees, I would guess. And I'm just wondering about, you know, what, if that. Yeah, but what, what employees do is they sell those shares you know, to realize the gains. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I mean, there's no evidence that it's concentrated ownership among insiders. That, okay, that's what I was trying to get at. Is... Yeah, no, that's not, that's not the case. Okay, thank you. That's um, really interesting. Okay, so here's a question about what's your view on the turmoil in the repo market? And the best response to this question is this article from Greg If that I simply copied here. 
And I don't think you want to get in the business of redistributing Wall Street Journal articles. So I don't know how you handle this, but this is this is the best explanation of what happened uh, that I saw during this whole episode. And the episode came and went. I should point that out. It's it was just so you know, just so you know, I should. The way that you could do this is you just show the date and the headline and not the entire body of the story. That's fair use. Okay. The so date. if you show the author, the date, and the headline, you know, okay. that's fine. That then then we are not on the hook. Right. It's when you show images and and the entire text. You can even show a piece of the text. Yeah, but just make, do it like a do a quotation or just a. Excerpt. That's okay. Exactly, and it's better even if you you know just you know type the quote out because but. You know, the way to get in trouble is to publish something like this. Is what to publish something. Got it. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, Greg Epp nailed it in this article. And the punchline is, is that it, it's a matter of um, Federal Reserve plumbing. <laughs> and the reason I say that, and the plumbing changed post-crisis. And so banks, the, the big banks, the big eight or 11 banks, whatever it is, are hanging on to their cash. And they didn't. They weren't interested in making loans to the second tier banks where that's where the liquidity, there was a scramble for liquidity. So they weren't interested in making those loans to the second tier banks for a whole variety of reasons. And so there was this crisis practically came and went, you know, in one week where second tier banks were scrambling for liquidity and they weren't being able to borrow from the big banks. So the Fed Reserve stepped in and provided the liquidity. So it, it really was a not, it's really a non-issue. And the punchline is over here on the right sidebar is that the Fed is now weighing creating a permanent facility to offer such repo loans on demand to the second tier banks. The reality is that our banking system is more liquid than it's ever been uh, in the wake of the reforms um, Dodd-Frank reforms, and so, um, and that that came through loud and clear in the financial stability report too that I commented on on Tuesday. So again, I, I, in my mind, it's all under the heading Federal Reserve plumbing or banking system plumbing, and they just unclogged the drain <laughs> or something like that, and and now made liquidity available to that second tier of banks. Here's a question. Um, Martin is referring to this slide. There was the issue of job skills versus jobs needed. How does this impact job skill needed versus job skill of unemployed? Well, we've actually flipped the issue on its head. The, the issue that he's talking about was, do we are we educating people enough to fill the new economies requirements for uh, employee, employee requirements. Do we have people who are educated enough and highly enough to fill more sophisticated jobs? Whereas this issue that I'm referring to with this poster from our local Safeway store is, do we have enough people without even high school educations or high school educated people to fill all these jobs on the very bottom rungs <laughs> i which is why i found this i find this so amazing our economy is at such full employment that we can't even find enough of the least educated least skilled people to fill all of these categories which is a great problem to have i think it's absolutely fantastic you see what i saying? yeah so martin is referring to a problem that that we thought we had, <laughs> and evidently we don't have that anymore. In fact, there was a terrific article in the Wall Street Journal just last week talking about how companies now are so desperate for people that they're taking people with high school degrees or even two-year degrees, and they're spending the money now to train them in much more sophisticated roles. Um, you know, which is really great. And, they, and those people all will be earning much higher wages than these people here at the very bottom end of the runs, the lowest yeah. runs. Yeah, and there's that Amazon TV commercial where the woman 
the young woman says, you know, wow, and they're paying me to get better skills. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> you, you know what I'm going? Yeah. Hey, yeah. um, and um, um, you know, this picture that you took over here, um, I think we ought to, we, next time you show one of these or whenever you show one of these, mm -hmm. could you ask everybody to send in their pictures when they come across stuff like this? Oh, uh, sure. I think it, you know, like I, I love that stuff. Like when you took, you took a picture of like a Home Depot. It was a Home uh, Depot. Yeah, two years yeah. ago. Yeah, I love that. You know, it was a picture of like a, a help wanted sign in front of a Home Depot or something. And I, I, yeah, and I think those fundamental signs, if we see them and collect them, um, you know, I'm happy to publish them on A for A in this Q and A that we do whenever you speak. Okay. And I think, you know, this is a way, you know, to to drop names of the people that are paying attention to this and give you publicity for, um, you know, being loyal fans and being so engaged, because um, I think this is the best kind of fundamental research and that supports it. So if you want to, if everybody, uh, when you're listening to this, just think about looking for those things, uh, those signs of economic uh, growth or, or, or lack of it uh, and economic problems, that, uh, take a snapshot and send it to us. And those your pictures or your stories, because it would be, It'd be great. It'd be yeah, I think. It, yeah, yeah, I'm really fundamental. But anyway, just wanted to mention that. Go ahead, please. And then pers pursuant and kind of a, a follow on to um, to to that last slide, but addressing the same thing. I just wanted to go back and emphasize what Chairman Powell said in this speech. And this is the latest speech that Powell has given dated November 25th. But he was remarking on how this long expansion is now benefiting low and middle income communities to agree that it has not been felt for many years. For many years is an understatement. I don't remember statistics anything like what we're seeing for my whole career. I think you have to go back to the 60s. Specifically then what we're talking about is that employ unemployment by education attainment in this chart less than high school degree is at a record all-time low by a significant margin here you can see it and then by a high school degree same thing and some college and so forth but it's these categories less than high school degree and high school only that are so impressive and so encouraging about this economy and and, that, and that's when you know that so politicians who are making these points well this economy is you know it's I don't know what some of the, you know, the people who are campaigning for office often try to make a negative picture out of the economy. Well, it's absolutely not true. This is the best employment economy I've ever seen. And it's just so important to understand these numbers. And over here, by race, black employees have never had a lower unemployment rate than they do today. And again, by a significant margin, we're under 6% and the previous low on this was 8%, wow. And same thing for Hispanic. So this is really great news. And to the extent we can keep this thing rolling, which I think we will, these numbers probably get even better. And this is the very last one. He said, wouldn't consumer spending sector funds be much more meaningful than the four particular stocks? I couldn't figure out what he's asking about until it dawned on me. He's referring to that slide where I put uh, Home Depot, Walmart, Costco, right. Right. And, and so um, he's that's a good point. Well, you, you know, you just looked at four stocks. What about the whole consumer discretionary spending picture? And that's the answer then. This is a sector fund. This is a consumer spending sector fund. And you can see it's making that same point that I was making. It's a record all time high. And there's just no weakness being um, obvious here. Whereas in the in the lead up to the last recession, um, you can see how this thing broke down so dramatically beginning in early to mid 2007 and the measured onset of recession was January of 2008. So this chart actually makes my point a lot more dramatically than my four stocks, but you see that. So the, the onset of recession 
was measured at January of 2008 here, where my cursor is. And this chart started rolling over summer before that. So you started to see weakness in retail well before the measured onset of recession. Whereas today you're seeing nothing but strength and you're hitting record all time highs. So thank you, Philip Walker. That was a, um, a good observation. Um, yeah, but I got a feeling you chose those four mega stocks for right because the, for right. a reason. I mean, right, I did right. Um, anything more to say about that trend on the um, the people coming back into the workforce? Surprising. Yeah, I, I think it. I think it was on slide forty. Well, on a couple. Well, on slide fifty-six of that session i i wrote down some questions slide 56 so and um that was when you you were talking about people our age working longer i think yes and right I, I, and um so it's it's 58 and uh yeah i'm glad you raised this because you and i talked about this and then i went and dug out the data and i huh? had comments I had commented to you that I thought the number was 25%. And um, so here is the actual data series. And so the story starts here on slide 57. See the participation rate, actual versus forecast. And the participation rate is what's, what is what's fooling the people who made this forecast. And part of the reason, if not the whole, I'd have to break down and see all of what's contributing but i have to believe a major contributor then is that people in excess of age 65 are participating in greater numbers than ever before and that's this data series yeah and i just you know think that this group really knows has been in touch with that trend because of the nature of their work yeah they're seeing they report that that you know, they actually are telling, been saying for years, people are more interested in sort of, you know, living longer by working yeah. and being engaged. And, and engaged. So good point. And so who knows what the ceiling on this number is? I mean, is it 50% of the people, maybe 65 and older? Is it 70%? Well, that's crazy. So we, yeah, we, we just don't know about yeah, yeah. elasticity, I guess, of that. Elasticity, yep, and longevity plays into it. And um, yes, right. Mm -hmm. 